I want to welcome you to Prime Time uh, here at the library. Prime Time is a year-long celebration of the academic and exper uh, experimental accomplishments of our faculty, students, and staff. And it's a collaboration, uh, collaborative project between the Friends, uh, the BU Library, and many other offices on campus. Uh, so this happens continuously. It's a wonderful thing that happens here at the library. And I want to thank the library for having us back, um, co-sponsoring this event with the English department. Uh, next Thursday, January the 31st, uh, we'll kick off the spring semester series with Associate Professor of Education and Director of Early Childhood Services, Jolene Pearson and Beth Quest from, um, from the Working Family Resource Center as they present Premature Babies, A Different Beginning, Information and Resources for Parents. So, um, and uh, I'm sure there will be lots of wonderful information about that subject. Uh, today we have the Writers' Workshop, and this is our group from Interim, January Interim. Uh, every January there's a Writers' Workshop, and the students uh, work on a particular project of their own, and we have uh, different genres of fiction, prose, and poetry represented today. Uh, there was a wonderful group of 10 students this January. Maria has left us for Paris. So uh, we're a group of nine today, um, and you will hear a very short excerpt from their project. So will you please welcome with me Writer's Workshop. Right. Hi, my name is Brad. Um, I did a short story about a character named Cyrus who is uh, struggling um, in modern society to uh, discover his individuality and where he belongs. Um, I uh, invented this city called Wick. Um, I spent a few pages describing that, which I will spare you guys of. Um, but uh, he is, the Cyrus will start out, he's sitting in the gardens of the city, called Modesty Gardens. He's sitting in a tree. Okay. An indescribable sense of disconnect adhered to Cyrus, which probably led him to sit between the wood. Cyrus was not a deep-thinking individual, did not care for pressing his feet at the water margins of, of Wick, but he was still frequently susceptible to the choke of loneliness or the mausoleum of boredom. So, though on fewer occasions than the artist that sat repainting the scream, pale fingers would knead his soul and remind him of necessary development. On this particular day, Cyrus had woke in case in an eggshell. Normally, a hangover or haze from the Saturnalia that occurred the night before could be blamed. But Cyrus was not stoned or hungover, and this was of an entirely emotional nature. Cyrus would not have compared it to an eggshell, and would have denied the existentialism of the matter, because he wouldn't know what existential meant, not because it wasn't accurate. But he would admit to have felt the formless void of beginnings. He felt his hands, his hands squirm the yoke, and his head frequently submerged in the viscosity of it all. Cyrus could not move from the gloom. But even if he could, he wouldn't know how to split the shell and jump from the heated pan of question. Behind the split tree, Cyrus heard an entertainer shouting to a crowd. Cyrus moved from the tree and joined the show. The entertainer was a local magician performing moderate tricks and illusions from his card table of props. Cyrus, unconsciously, felt tempted to ask the magician to strike his wand and turn him into something more certain. He wore the stereotypical top hat, verdi, and saffron gloves with a matching bow tie and cape. The magician called himself Jupiter, a name children were more fond of than adults. The children also loved pulling at the curls of Jupiter's elaborate mustache to see if it would fall from his face. It usually did. <laughs> Cyrus briefly studied his aesthetic. The magician moved in quick, robust fashions, overwhelming the audience with ribbons and flying cards as if the planet was imploding. His show was predicated on the theme of gods performing supernatural acts on Earth. If a member of the crowd had started to leave, he would stop them and implore them to witness his next miracle. Between the wonders, he would advertise his services like a rehearsed commercial. He had just transmogrified an orange paper egg into an Oreo from his palms when Cyrus walked up. The crowd hardly had time to watch the Oreo fly away before he transition, transitioned into his next trick. Cyrus turned, however, and watched the bird flutter in a black-orange frenzy, as if it truly had been conjured into the brave new world. It did not know where to go, east, west, north, or south, and flew in feral seizures throughout the air like the poet's gesticulations, 
Beneath the sun, the poet, the bird's orange had shuddered with a vibrant, ostentatious glow, while the black back crusted the top like a burn mark, as if it had flown too close to the sun. Cyrus felt his stomach pull with the bird by an invisible wire. They saw themselves in the glass. They both ascended through the city's white noise, twisting in the buzzings and murmurings of progressive signals and up towards something. A text from Cyrus's mother sang in his pocket. When he looked back up, the Oreo was gone. She asked him where he was and told him to come home. He would have stayed and asked Jupiter for his secrets, maybe even learn an illusion and become his own god. After all, that was what attracted the crowds. But his mother needed to interrupt because he needed to be home. He crossed the avenue that ran along the gardens and walked on the pavements of Hilton Street. There were multiple men with pendulous ties bustling in the streets and cursing into their phones. Some were lawyers walking to the courthouse that sat at the edge of Hilton Street and faced the gardens. Others were bankers or stockbrokers starting their second pack, six, second cigarette pack for the day. Cyrus wanted to bump one from them, but figured it might not be the best idea since they might question his age and, his, and then his integrity. Had he questioned these things yet? One of them nearly knocked Cyrus over and hardly apologized for it. The asshole didn't have time, Cyrus figured. He was too busy trying to wave for a cab before it passed. A page of the current newspaper, someone had gotten distracted and dropped it from their balcony got stuck on the wet wheel of the cab. It spun in the rush of traffic until it became old news. <laughs> Cyrus continued walking in the shadows of Mogul's Hotel and corporate offices until the pavement turned. He crossed the street and walked next to a sunglass brand store. They sold pairs of orange tints and black frames for $400, if he had the money. How are y'all doing today? Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote a short piece um, in my last creative writing class, and uh, I had wrote three characters that I really liked, and essentially I didn't want to give up on the characters even though I gave up on that piece because it just wasn't uh, where I wanted it to go. So I rewrote essentially the three characters and put them in a different setting, um, and they're three teenagers, um, and essentially they take one of the main characters uh, parents cars for a joyride and in the process end up uh, hitting and killing someone and so this short story is essentially a introspection on their own personalities and uh, how they react to the tragedy. <clears throat> Danny sat in the driver's seat of his dad's 1950 Oldsmobile 88 convertible tapping his finger on the steering wheel drumming a beat into the rubber. Vince was late but then again Vince was always late. Danny pursed his lips, then exhaled. Sometimes he wished that, for once, Vince would think about someone other than himself. It was dusk out, the darkening summer sky turning a shade of gray-purple, smears of pink and orange surrounding the descending sun. Walter sat in the back, his thin frame placed upright in the seat, hands on his lap, cleaning his glasses. With a loud bang, the front door sh closed, and Vince hopped down the stairs two at a time. His shiny black hair was slicked back with copper-scented pomade that he probably stole from the grocery store on 12th Street. What took you so long? Danny questioned impatiently. I had to do some stuff, Vince said, waving it away. Such as? Stuff. Danny rolled his eyes and started the car. Vince slouched in his seat, one foot up on the dash, the other tapping slightly on the floor. He wore a white t-shirt tucked into his jeans and black boots. He had a pack of camels rolled up in his left sleeve. He turned towards Danny, cocked his head, and threw a toothy grin. Danny hated that grin. It was the grin that always got Vince out of trouble in high school. It was the grin that got him all the girls, and the grin that made all the boys want to be him. Danny hated it. But Vince has been, had been his friend since grade school, and he had learned to tolerate his antics. Walter had, a little, Walter had a little more trouble with Vince's antics. Walter was Danny's cousin, and his parents were always pressuring Danny to spend time with him. Danny didn't mind hanging out with him, but whenever Vince was around, things always got tense. For some reason, Vince loved harassing Walter, usually going out of his way to do something to push his buttons. It was probably because they were so different. Vince got invited to all the cool parties, and Danny sometimes too, although never Walter, which suited him just fine. Walter would rather stay in and draw airplanes or birds than go out and be forced to do something that might get him in trouble. He adjusted his plaid button-up shirt and spoke for the first time since getting in the car. So, where are we going exactly? You two never told me. Why don't you shut up and find out, Vince mumbled through the cigarette he was trying to light. 
We're just going for a drive. My pop's out of town and I wanted to give his car a little spin, Danny said lightheartedly, attempting in vain to ease, ease the tension between the two. They could never seem to agree on anything, and Danny usually had to be the mediator between them. He glanced over at Vince and for once, for the first time, noticed the small metal grip peeking out of Vince's waistband. Vince, what's that? What's what? What's that sticking out of your waistband? Oh, this, Vince said nonchalantly. It's my dad's gun. I figured if you were going to be a badass and take your dad's car, I'd have to do you one better. Just think of it as the cherry on top of the pie. Anywho, I don't even think it's loaded, so relax. Vince continued to attempt to light the cigarette, and after a few more tries, succeeded. Relax. Are you kidding me? You better keep that hidden. We could get in a lot of trouble if we get caught in this car, much less with a gun, too. Why do you always have to do stuff like this? Danny took a breath and closed his eyes for a moment. And do you have to smoke? You know my dad hates that smell. Oh, he'll be fine. Besides, it's been all day since I've had one. I deserve a little treat, Vince insisted. Walter coughed. Ah, that smoke's getting in my face, Vince. Vince turned around and took a long drag of his cigarette, staring Walter down the whole time. Walter usually knew better than to provoke him. Vince was always a comment away from some kind of aggression, whether it was putting Walter in a headlock or pulling his shirt over his head. But in between the joking and lighthearted bullying, there was some real darkness in Vince's eyes. Walter th thought back to the moment, suspended in time. About three years ago, Walter and his family were staying at Danny's house for Easter. Walter had come over to borrow something from Danny, but Danny had biked down to the store to get some milk and eggs. While Vince waited for Danny, he started playing catch with Danny's dog, Rex. When Rex, Rex lost interest in the game, Vince had become irrationally mad, pulling the dog by his collar roughly and kicking him mercilessly. He turned around to see Vince, to see Walter staring at him through the guest room window. Walter never forgot that frigid stare that Vince had shot at him. So, guys, Danny said, attempting to ease the tension, where should we go? Strip club, Vince offered. I don't think that's a good idea, muttered Walter tentatively. We're not going to a strip club, Vince. What if my dad's, what if someone saw my dad's car parked outside there? He'd have my hide. I'm just making suggestions, Vince stated defensively. Well, all roads lead to Rome, light. Let's just drive somewhere downtown, said Danny. The white-walled wheels turned away from the curb, and Danny pressed down on the accelerator. The automobile grumbled into life, and they found themselves cruising the streets, glancing at the large signs advertising Coke and Hershey's chocolate. The scenery began to evolve from suburban homes to industrial buildings, and eventually great towers bordering both sides of the street. The light from the sky started to fade, and before long it was gone completely, leaving only headlights to illuminate the way. All around, the towers loomed overhead, making the, shrink, the streets shrink and seem claustrophobic. Smoke hung obesely about the air, and Danny started to feel as though the convertible was a poor choice. It left him feeling too open and exposed, almost as if he was naked. The silence in the car rapidly became too much for Vince, and he started to antagonize Walter as usual. My name is Carrie Lindgren. Um, I did a book of poetry called Eardrums Wasted on Outrage, and I'll just read just a little portion of the introduction just to kind of explain the meaning of the title and a little backstory. The title Eardrums Wasted on Outrage is based off my collection of poetry. While thinking of a title, I noticed most of my poems I've written, I incorporated eardrums in some aspect. I believe our world has thrown so many negative voices and ear sounds at our eardrums that they have become wasted on outrage. They have been worn and beaten, but haven't really noticed because we're used to it, including myself. And so, oh, I actually wrote a little excerpt before um, I started my poetry. And I, have, of course, the title of Eardrums, and I just kind of want to read that part too as well. I've um, it's called Ear Drums, and it says, I have heard the distant pulse of drums beating around the world, ready to come forward, the long last melody flowing in their ears. And the poem I'll be reading for you today, I actually wrote in here, um, is called Face Value, which is based off my running shoes that I wear. My shoes are a sweatshop. Salt stains break the drought. Coated with liquid, hard work, li with liquid of hard work, a worldwide network. My shoes are a bank investment, where business companies skyrocket. 
Owners regurgitate their pride, hopefully. The second time, it will taste better denying reality. My shoes are pain, whips that kiss the skin, burns that cover evidence of oppression, an act of desperation. My shoes are the mist of great, my shoes are the mist of ugly truth, Jesus' perfume. Celebrities strut their counterfeit like it's armor, printed on ads in every newspaper. My shoes are a factory fire in Bangladesh, the scents of burnt flesh. The bars unable to melt from this prison, reaching out for motion. My shoes are hope, waiting for su from sunrise to sunset for a sign like Job. Scratching away memories like sores, jay jamming through windows. But, but most of all, my shoes are a constant reminder. Their occupation isn't for a foot to be placed, for that suffering has a face. Mm -hmm. I'm Steve McGeary. Um, I wrote a memoir about a life-changing experience I had. Um, it was actually my first surgery, so uh, this is a piece I'm going to read for you guys. I come out of the bathroom and walk down the same empty hallway. As I return to my parents and Dr. Pyatt in the waiting room of the neurology department, I can't help but think of how much I've changed. The black sweatpants and gray t-shirt I hold in my right hand are my innocence and mindset through this whole process. I lost my selfish, invincible, longing to be noticed freshman boy apparel and acquired a less confident, worrisome, trying to be unnoticed outfit that I had no idea how to wear. Are we ready? Asked Dr. Pyatt as he looks at me, then quickly turns to mom. Uh, yeah. I couldn't have sounded any more uncertain. Follow me. Mom, Deb, and I are led back into a large room. In it are many beds separated by tall white curtains. Is this where you go when you're dying? I'm going to have ten other people laying around me while I'm on my deathbed? There's no turning back as a spirited young nurse with jet black hair comes in to record my vitals. We'll be back to take you shortly, she says with a teethy smile. Take me? Where? What the hell? Mom won't be there holding my hand while they saw my head open? I didn't agree to this. I can hardly call my hockey coaches and tell them I'm missing practice without her comforting me. This is bullshit. For the next five minutes, we make small talk. So how's school going, Stevo? asks Deb cheerfully. Uh, it's fine. All A's. Wouldn't expect anything less. Oh, I know. Moments later, a curtain is pulled back to reveal Dr. Pyatt and the young nurse. Does anyone have any questions before we get this underway? Unanimously, we all respond with a no, and I brace myself for the part I hated most, that damn IV needle. First comes the alcohol wipe. Better get those germs off before they stab me. Then it's the teal elastic band that's tied around my pa pale, hairless upper arm to force out a vein. How couldn't you love this? Finally, one, two, three. I grind my teeth and clench mom's fist as the long silver needle pierces my skin. Steve, any request before you take we take you? Just don't kill me. I turn to mom one last time and see her holding back tears as she is comforted by her sister. She kisses me on the forehead for one last time. Love you, mom. I love you too. My story is about a kid named Dean, and uh, Dean kind of is really naive about life, not only life, but death, and uh, he's kind of been sheltered in the negative things uh, in life. So at the beginning of the story, he goes deer hunt hunting deer with his dad, and the experience kind of disrupts his way of thinking, sort of changes him, so I'm just going to read the first part of the story. In a field there is a deer stand and it rises above the grass. The stand is located a hundred feet from the tree line. It is an old looking structure held up by four rustic pillars and has been rebuilt several times. Inside there are two people. Dean and his father sit in silence. Dean reaches into his pocket grabbing a granola bar and slowly picks, picks at it. They have been sitting for hours and both are beginning to get tired. 
Where are they? asked Dean, chewing. I don't know, his father said. Dean kept peeking out the windows of the enclosed stand to hopefully spot what they were searching for. Likely before the land, like before, the landscape had nothing in it. All that was evident was the wind whipping against the walls. Dean realized that the temperature started getting quite cold and wished he brought a thicker undershirt. He wished that he could be back comfortably at home reading a book or watching a movie. How much longer, Dean said while checking his watch. I don't know, let's, let's give it a little longer. Is it always like this? No. His father stood up from the one bench that creaked while his weight lifted. He walked around the small room searching the landscape. Still no sign of anything. He, wa he wanted at least one deer to show its antlers. Since this was Dean's first time out hunting with them, he would have liked a little more action. Let's give it one more hour, his father said, sitting, sitting back down. Okay. Fidgeting, Dean has never been used to the cold or being so motionless for such long periods of time. His father started to shake. His legs started to shake, not for his own liking, but his, but his body's, just trying to get the blood back into them. The noise began to echo inside the room, and this did not sit well with his father. Quiet down and stop shaking, Dean whispered his father sternly. But I'm cold, exclaimed Dean. Deer hunting is all about being as quiet as possible. You may not think you're making a lot of noise, but you are. But Dad, there are no deer. We, we have been out, been out here all day. Look outside, nothing. Just stop moving and give, give it a little more time. Dean did not understand why he needed to be so quiet, but he stopped shaking anyway. He liked that his father invited him out here and did not want to make him mad for doing so. As they waited, Dean looked at his father and wondered what he would look like and where he will be when he is the same age. If he would have gray hair, be tall and muscular, or for that matter, even be married. Dean wanted to grow up and be just like him. Thirty minutes later, light brown animals appeared from the tree line. Two deer took their time walking out. Dean thought they looked majestic. His father slowly raised his hand to signal to stay quiet. He pointed over at the open windows and grabbed his gun. Dean stood as quietly as possible and grabbed his gun too. He watched as his father looked down his sights, eyeing up the target. He has had a large Remington rifle, which he has used for most of his life. Dean was given a gun for his 12th birthday. He never asked for it, but his father said every man should have one. Dean got into position, his small Remington planted against his shoulder. As he looked down the sight at the unsuspecting deer, everything got quiet. Dean no longer heard the wind whipping or felt the numbing in his legs. All he could hear and feel was his heartbeat rapidly rising. His father looked calm and collected, someone that knew exactly what they were doing. All right, son, this one is yours. Remember what we t talked about. Aim down the sight. Do not take your eyes off the target and steady your hands, and then just pull the trigger. Dean watched as the two be deer began to come closer and closer to the stand. They were completely oblivious to the fact that two people were in the same area stalking them. When they got close enough, his father patted him on the shoulder, signaling to shoot. Dean kept his eyes locked on the larger buck. He relaxed his hands, held his breath, and pulled the trigger. The pop that the gun set off started ring in his ear, ring in his ears louder than he anticipated, and the recoil of the gun was being much stronger, too. His shoulder was already hurting. Dean became scared by the power of this weapon. Through the side, he watched as the buck stumbled on the bullet's initial contact. He saw, it limped, saw how it limped while running to get away. The desperation that Dean could see in the deer made him sick. You got him. Great shot, his father said as they started to leave the stand. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Dean said as he put the safety on his gun. How'd it feel? Good. Dean's heart still pounding, knowing the truth the truth that the shot felt terrible. He had the feeling that he did something t wrong and was about to get caught. His stomach starting, starting to churn made him believe that he might be sick. As they left the stand, they began walking towards where the buck stood when it got struck. Dean could see blood on the dirt and a trail every so often which pointed the direction where they would find it. Dean did not like the sight of his blood, of this blood. He thought it would be like the movies where it would be fine, but in person, Dean thought it looked much darker. They walked about a quarter mile and could see the deer laying on the ground ahead of them. As they approached, his father patted him on the back. Dean, Dean thought to himself, it has been a while since that happened. Congrats, Dean, your first buck. You're going to remember this day. As they stood over the shallow breathing deer, Dean thought it looked like it gave up and accepted its fate. His father loaded the gun, turned the safety off, and shot it in the back of its neck, putting the hopeless deer out of its misery.
I'm going to read from my memoir, A Lineage of Excellence, and it's split into sections, so I'm going to read the section, A Surprise. How is she? They asked. A genuine smile would lift their lips. Weekly, while I was still living at home, someone would ask me about my grandma Corlin. Cozy to me and most people I know. She was the one who hired me, they would usually tack on. Or, she was such a fabulous boss. Or, you are so blessed to have her. But every time, the inquiry was followed with a wistful look and the comment, she brought the best treats to meetings. My grandma always said if you feed people, they'll work harder. It's easy to say, no lie coating my tongue, that my grandma Cozy is the sweetest person alive. The expression, love you to death, seems to be the motto she guides her, her life by. What I may have considered smothering affection in my youth, obnoxious in its omnipresence, I've recognized as the purest form of sacrifice and devotion as I mature. <clears throat> my grandma will go out of her way to pour kindness over those around her. She will lavish gifts on her grandkids, purchase tacky potted plants from fundraisers, hang up handmade ornaments and cards, call and make sure everything is all right, clean the apartments of strangers, drive my aunt around town, around town, buy a mug for her granddaughter whose texting noise sounds like cows that states, YTV, you're the best, and then proceed to act like it's true. My grandma never asks for anything. When we were little, she bathed us, making sure to have the same rare brand of shampoo my mom used. She let us wrap yarn all the way around her house, leaving our spy maze up for days longer than patients should allow. Grandma Cozy always asked if she could order a friend's any food or pick something up. When I was in fifth grade, Grandma broke her neck. She was trying to hang up a new birdhouse by standing on a chair. She fell off. She still stands on chairs to arrange her birdhouses. Fifth grade was not a great year for me either. I missed 45 days of school. My dizzy spells were so bad that I couldn't make it through the school days. My little girl limbs confined to a couch. <coughs> Together we mourned the loss of activity. We watched Martha Stewart and Scooby-Doo and she read to me and my dolls in the garden. At the height of her career, she chose another profession, retiring to be what she called a full-time grandma. Often, it seems that everything that's possible in my life is possible because of her sacrifices. That's why I could never understand how anyone could treat her badly. I can't understand how anyone could be loved by her, soak up her care like a greedy sponge, and then use her up, shoving her aside in return. I spent a lot of my childhood despising my grandpa Richard. For a long time, I was too young to understand the complications that tangled the two people together. He was stingy and retired. He was crabby toward my grandma, though never his grandchildren. Even my little girl heart was disgusted by the servitude he seemed to expect of her. My grandma was fun-loving. In her day, she was an avid sock hop attendee, a dancing girl, smiling, spinning in her poodle skirt and knit sweater. This man, this old man, an avid watcher of Law & Order Special Victims Unit, did not fit into the picture. When I was older, I would gain the knowledge that was supposed to explain the situation. My grandma was divorced. In the early 1960s, she had divorced her first husband. The first husband would forever replace the name David. My grandma, when she mentions him, maintains that she would go through the whole experience again because she got her two precious daughters. They were her two precious daughters who, while she was out waitressing working two jobs because he, the first husband, couldn't keep a job, would care for themselves while he, the first husband, abandoned the four-year-old with the two-year-old so that he, the first husband, could go on out on yet another drinking spree. Years and years later, children and ex-wives, half-siblings of my mom, would spring up across the country, proving his, the first husband's, loyalty was not questionable just to my grandma. My grandma once related to me that she regretted her wedding. We were in Starbucks. She was sipping her decaf mocha frappuccino with skim, transferring most of her bright lipstick to the big green straw. I was caught off guard. She rarely talked about the past, especially not in a negative manner. At first I thought she was talking about the first husband. I remember her once mentioning her parents had been against the marriage, but I was surprised again. I wish the girls had been there. Oh, her marriage to Richard. We drove to Cottage Grove. It was simple, just the two of us and the pastor and his wife who introduced us. Then we went home. No honeymoon, no little girl's dream of poofy skirts, no celebration or ceremony. Her own daughters, my mom, confused and hastily moved. Her parents broken-hearted, resentful at a second loss. I couldn't respond. My grandma, who didn't ask for anything. My grandma, who slaved to make things right. My grandma. My heart ached for my grandma. Hello. Um, okay. 
I'm Brennan. Uh, I'm really hungry right now, and so I'm going to try to push out the fantasies I have of Burger King for a few minutes. I wrote a story uh, just about driving around, seeing family, the relationship mm -hmm. issues that come with that. Uh, yeah, so here we go. Uh, like any skill, learning how to drive a car with a manual transmission takes practice. I learned when I was 16 in a Ford Escort that belonged to a friend. He never cleaned that car. You had to work your feet back and forth to find the floor beneath the torn wrappers and late assignments. We took laps around a fast food restaurant's drive through as I frantically tried to balance the clutch and find gears. I'm sure the employees hated me, stalling at the window and yelling obscenities audible across the sliding glass. My friend kept calling clutch shift gas release, trying desperately to coach me into keeping the engine turning. A few years later, I bought a sports car with the same, same style transmission. It was a much nicer car than the Ford Escort. The car with the stupid personal plate of love to run. My friend had loved to run. But the method was the same, clutch, shift, gas, release. I never know how to behave around my family. <clears throat> I become quiet and don't interact much. I was busy listening to punk rock and learning how to smoke when I should have been going to church. They aren't like me, or maybe I'm not like them. Some of my relatives live in my area. Most live in different states. One night, my aunt and uncle, the ones who have four children and a golden retriever, invited me over to watch a football game along with some of their friends. They live close by. I decided to go even though I don't know how to act. Or family. There's an obligation that comes with that. I threw on another shirt, one that wasn't as faded and used, and left my apartment. Down the stairs that make hollow noises when touched, out to white neighbors and clean air, into the black sports car with the high torque engine and high insurance premiums. My seatbelt softly clicks and I start the engine. <clears throat> a man with visions of a brave new world called speed the only truly modern sensation. I first found that thrill of motion when I was 11. Our neighbor down the street owned a maroon Corvette convertible, the car he traded for his black 68 Camaro. That Camaro had much better lines, it was truly timeless, but not nearly as quick as the newer car. I rode my bike to the end of his driveway to Gawk the day he bought it. He knew that I loved cars. You want a ride? Yeah, that'd be awesome. We slowly rolled down the street, humming through the evening neighborhood, waving at parents watching their children play catch in the front yard. At the end of the block, right before the empty five-mile stretch of two-lane blacktop, he slammed into first gear, creasing the pavement. My head violently swung back into the tan leather of the seat. I was too short to catch the headrest. Sixty miles an hour came before I had time to process what had happened. The noise of tires clawing at asphalt and exhaust expulsion slapped my face sober. Eighty-five flew into a hundred that flew into a hundred and twenty-five. Fourth gear reached nine thousand RPMs and he began to slow down. My breath came back. Don't tell your parents. I won't. <clears throat> um, I get back into my car. I pilot past houses with shutter blinded windows holding in the secrets of who sleeps inside. That dog who stays in the corner house. That bitch who barks whenever I cross over for a cigarette isn't out. She has a mean bark, quick and violent. I hate that sound. I'm sure if the gate was ever left unlatched, if a hole was dug under the fence, she'd give pursuit and hurt me. Latch onto my leg and thrash her head back and forth till ligaments were frayed and torn. Deep bites flowing blood that flesh held back before. I always have the urge when she barks at me to go over and kick her in the side. A swift hard blow that sends her screaming back with a twisted face and breaks a rib or two. A kick that makes me grunt and swear. I hope her owners see me do it. <laughs> Um, my name is Krista Wilson, and the project that I've been working on is based on the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, so I've done a series of photographs and then written a series of um, short stories as well as nonfiction essays. And so the particular um, part that I'm reading from for today is from a story called Broken Glass Bottles, and I won't say too much except that we're entering into the scene where Lexi, the 15-year-old protagonist, is about to share her big secret with her best friend. <coughs> When Carrie entered Lexi's room, she took her usual spot on the quilted bed. Before commencing, Lexi shut the door firmly. Privacy and order, Lexi glared at Carrie like she might commit cold-blooded murder. What's wrong with you, Lexi? You're freaking me out. I'm pregnant. The words came out of Lexi's mouth with her exhale. 
It was relieving to get the truth from off her back. If only she could remove it from her stomach too. Prove it, came the first disbelieving response. So Lexi dug through the trash to find the pea stick she mummified in double ply toilet paper. Just that afternoon, she walked the half mile from the high school to the local Walmart. Before the pregnancy test, there was no real indicator that she was pregnant, except for the chronic nausea and stomach aches. Mostly, Lexi was worried about Carrie's comment. Maybe you're pregnant. I'm pregnant, Lexi stated once again, in case the yes on the pregnancy test was not enough proof. What are you going to do? Your parents are going to kill you. Lexi shrugged her shoulders. She had seen the movie Juno enough times to know she could work through this whole pregnancy thing. <laughs> Plus, getting out of gym class for the rest of the year would be a perk. Keep it. Those words ended the conversation, except for Carrie saying repeatedly, Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you're going to die! Carrie was the hardest person to tell. And all of her family, her school, and the whole host of heaven, Carrie was the only one who respected Lexi. When Carrie binged at the parties, it was Lexi who, no matter her own misadventures, held Carrie's hair back the entire night as she bent with drunken shame over the toilet bowl. It's a rare thing to get respect as a 15-year-old, especially if you're pregnant. The final months were bearable, at least at school. People, people rarely directed snarky comments at Lexi because of the mix of awe and fear that teenage pregnancies create. That's not true with adults. For them, it's usually a knowing sympathy or fire and brimstone judgment in the case of Lexi's father. For a whole month, he preached on the aggravating problem of adultery, and not just at church. Lexi knew personally from those final contractions about fire and brimstone judgment. The hospital room was loud when Lexi entered. She didn't know what an epidural was, but she managed to shout through the pain and ignorance, Give me the drugs! Whether drugged or simply exhausted, Holding the baby in her arms for the first time did little to awaken Lexi's maternal instinct. With the bald child bawling in her arms, Lexi questioned her quick judgment on keeping it. If a 15-year-old ever felt foolish, it was then. Sitting in the hospital, the responsibility of the mistake burned with every breath in her hands. workshop, I decided to put together a fiction piece based on an idea I had last year and just kind of left for this. Um, so I'm going to read the prologue to the story. An unlikely story begins at the Cozy Cup Cafe. This uh, particular restaurant was really more of a diner, but the owners had long ago decided that it was the name was better as a cafe. So in this diner cafe, an elderly gentleman sat in a booth far away from everyone else, and yet also close to the kitchen. He was doing nothing out of the ordinary, simply thinking deep thoughts over his cup of coffee while waiting for a slice of cherry pie. What was out of the ordinary was this old with this old man was the old uniform he was wearing. Everything about the naval uniform looked aged. The colors were faded. The ends were threadbare, and the nameplate was tarnished and scratched, leaving Monroe as the only discernible word. Monroe, at, this t at the time the story begins, had finally received his pie. However, he was interrupted before he could take his first bite. Ah, Dr. Monroe, said a scholarly fellow who was standing with his arms, his hands clasped behind his back. Dr. Kirchner, replied Dr. Monroe disdainfully. Dr. Kirchner then sat opposite Monroe at the table, placing his hands directly in his lap, as Monroe knew was his habit. You know, began Kirchner, I am glad I found you. <laughs> Dr. Monroe, you stick out like a sore thumb with that uniform. I'm not hiding from you, was all Monroe answered with. Ah, but you have you not heard what happened to the others? Kirchner removed his sick glasses, setting them on the table, and then used the same hand to return a loose strand of hair 
to the bald spot on his head. Monroe took a bite of pie and said, Yeah, I heard. They died. Don't you find that a bit odd? asked Kirchner. No, we're all still vulnerable to cancer. Suddenly, Dr. Kirchner's demeanor changed entirely as he prodded at Monroe with one more question. I need to know what the perfect serum is, James. Tell me now. After another bite of pie, Monroe replied, rather coyly, You think we were clueless? We knew you wanted it for yourself. Look, I don't have it, and I don't know where the serum is. Angry, Kirchner dismissed the waitress coming to take his order, then said, I find it funny that all the others said the same thing. By trial and error, I have concluded that you must have it, and you must know where it is. But I don't. But you do, Kirchner quietly raged. You have it. Give it to me, or I will kill you. Look, said Monroe, not intimidated in the slightest. What can you do to me here? We're out in public. You try something, someone will see you, you'll get caught, and be forced to fill out a life, full, live out a full life sentence. So what can you do, Dr. Wellme? Kirchner stood up furiously, grabbing his glasses, and said with calm venom, I told you never to call me that. I am Welkin Michael Kirchner. Never forget that. And it might also do you well to remember that I can do many terrible things to you in public, as long as no one knows it was me. With that, Kirchner stormed off. Monroe, believing he had won, chuckled as he took a bite of pie. But Kirchner was also chuckling to himself, and as soon as Monroe caught on to this, he was unsettled. He studied Kirchner closely. Then, in a chance reflection of the sunlight, Monroe caught a glimpse of the invisible wire pulling more and more taut in Kirchner's hands. Frantically, Monroe looked under the table to see a grenade strapped to the underside. The wire reached its full length, and at that moment, with a pop, it pulled the pin. It was only a few seconds until the Cozy Cup Cafe was racked by an explosion, and Dr. Kirchner was walking calmly away. Thank you so much for coming. I'll look for the publications of all these pieces sometime in the future. Thank you. <laughs>